uh, praise God, John chapter 8, we're talking about Jesus, our, the King of kings, Lord of lords, and our Savior. And he reveals himself in John's Gospel, chapter 8, as the light of the world. And so we're taking time to look at this great chapter and talk about what that actually means. And the last two weeks, we, we looked at a couple of scriptures, or we looked at the story prior to the passage that we're going to read this morning about the woman who was caught in adultery, brought before Jesus to be stoned. And we saw that the light of Jesus, God demonstrating in that situation what the light is and what uh, God wants us to learn about uh, himself and his ministry, is what the plan of God is. The plan of God being twofold. Number one, the light being Jesus exposes our sin. Now, in the story, just to kind of recap very briefly, the woman who was caught in sin was brought before Jesus, but the sin that was actually exposed was the hidden sin of the religious leaders who brought this woman before Jesus. The sin being that of hypocrisy, of pretending to be a righteous person when actually you've got a lot of sins and things wrong with you on the inside, and we talked about the implications of that. But also showed the light of God's purpose, which is redemption. And it's true that the wages of sin is death. We know that because the Word of God says that, but we also know that because the conviction of the Holy Spirit is upon our hearts. And one of the things that the Holy Spirit does, not so much with the believer because we've been set free from sin, but the ministry of the Holy Spirit, according to Jesus in the Gospel of John, is to convince the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. That man in and of himself, in his own deeds, is not worthy to spend eternity with God. But faces, if, if they do not receive Christ as Lord and Savior, eternal uh, judgment and eternal punishment because of their sin. But Jesus came not to condemn the world, but through the world, uh, through him rather, the world might be saved. And this was brought out in his interaction with both the sinners who were trying to stone this woman and the woman who was there. Like the last words of Jesus before he declared himself as the light of the world was, I do not condemn you, go and sin no more. Faith in Jesus demonstrated by uh, the willful act of repentance brings saving grace into the life of sinners great. We're all great sinners, but sinners great and small. But this morning, I'd like to talk about the witness of the Father. Because one of the things that we often come up against in sharing our faith with other people is whether or not Jesus is who he says he is, whether or not Jesus is uh, whom, what the Bible says he is, or who the Bible says, excuse me, he is. As many times in sharing Jesus, well, that's, people will respond, well, that's what you believe. But I choose to believe this. And I was really encouraged by your testimony, Pastor, this morning. I, I would say that's, uh, I, and maybe I'm prejudging, is a rarity, especially in New England, where there, there is a, a high level of skepticism regarding the things of God and regarding the person of the Lord Jesus. How do I know whether or not Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. And, and the prevailing, and, and actually I believe increasing uh, spirituality 
that there is in our nation today is I, I choose to believe and, and think of, of, of God and redemption and, and uh, e eternity. I choose to put my faith in, in what I believe or what I think seems good to me. And that is very, very dangerous. And not only is it dangerous because it's not true, it's dangerous because that type of thinking leads to death. There is a way that seems right unto men, but the end thereof are the ways of death. But Jesus came to dispel that. And he shared with those who were, who were ready to kill this woman, to stone this woman, to bring judgment upon her, that the, come, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. To dispel the fact that if you're a sinner, the only course in life is to die in your sin. That's not why Jesus came. Jesus came that we might have life and have it to the full. But the question then, amongst the religious leaders, and the question that we face today, and may I say not only in the world, but may I also say in the, there is a disturbing trend in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm talking about the born-again church, of doubt creeping in whether or not Jesus truly is who he says he is and whether or not what Jesus said is truly what he said. So it's important that we understand that Jesus is the light of the world and, and, and that he is received and that he is accepted and our response, as Jesus' response to the religious leaders at that time, is how do we know you are the one who you say you are? And you are the one who grants eternal life. And, he said, and Jesus responds, well, and we'll read it here in just a moment. In the law it says it, you need two witnesses. Two are, let every word be established. Two or at least, uh, at least two or three witnesses. And there are two witnesses before you. Number one is me. And secondly, there's the witness of the Father. And so this morning, I'd like to take time to talk about the witness of the Heavenly Father. How in receiving this witness, we as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ can be confirmed in our heart that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that Satan won't take away what God has so preciously planted in our hearts. But also we'll be confidently able to share with others that Jesus is the light of the world, and only through Jesus can you have life and life to the full. Let's read our text this morning, verses 12 through 20, and we'll be looking at others as well, but let's begin there. Then Jesus again spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisees said to him, you are testifying about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Jesus answered and said to them, even if I testify about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I came from and where I am going, but you do not know where I come from or where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I'm not judging anyone. But even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone in it, but I am the Father who sent me. Even in your law it has been written that the testimony of two men is true. I am he who testifies about myself, and the Father who sent me testifies about me. So they were saying to him, Where is your Father? Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my Father. If you knew me, you would know my Father also. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no one seized him because his hour had not come. Let's bow our hearts together 
And let's ask God's blessing as we look to God's word together. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness, your grace, and the testimony of your son Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for sending him, Lord, to this earth to redeem mankind through his death, burial, and resurrection. Dear God, now as, as we look to the word of God, we ask once again for the anointing of the Holy Spirit to fill this room. Uh, may, Lord, you give words to this, your speaker today, and may you give us ears to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying. And we ask this all in Jesus' precious name. Amen, amen. and amen. Uh, I've come to realize that, as I'm sure many of you have, if not all of you, uh, that seeing is not always believing. Uh, we've all probably seen it at a birthday party or maybe on television or I remember seeing uh, at a circus a, a magician or an illusionist. And they're not there conjuring black magic and doing things supernaturally. They're just doing things sleight of hand. And uh, uh, there, there's an art to it. In fact, I, I took a, a one-hour course on, on uh, illusion, and I learned how to hide a handkerchief in a fake thumb <laughs> and make it look real. And I pulled it off once, too. <laughs> but if you're anything like me, when you see an illusionist do a card trick or make something disappear or whatnot, you think to yourself, you know that it's not something magical. You think to yourself, how did they do that? What, what's the secret? What's the gimmick? In fact, years ago, I remember watching a documentary, and uh, one magician showed people how uh, he did, uh, he documented how he did different tricks. This also, this skepticism also goes over into the news, and, and I don't watch too much uh, uh, daily news. I, I do try to do more reading, and the reason for that is this where especially if uh, um, a, a politician or a leader or someone newsworthy, if they make a statement uh, regarding an, an issue, uh, oftentimes either in print or on media, they'll take a, a, a clip or a snippet of that speech or of that statement they're going to make and they'll use and they'll edit that and, and use that perhaps out of context, to forward their narrative as far as what they want you to believe. And you might say, well, who does that? They all do that. That's why whenever I hear a story, I like to go and read different articles about that and see really what happened, because it's very difficult if you're just watching evening news or, or cable news especially to really hear what's going on, because you don't see the whole picture. And in, in many ways, this describes the plight of mankind. Man has been created in the image of God. And even though we've been marred by sin, we're, we're still very precious and valuable to God. And, and, and everything we're doing today and everything about this book and everything about anything the church of the Lord Jesus Christ has done is about redemption. It's about, about bringing people back to Jesus. And there's only one way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. But man has, in and of himself, has a hard time wrapping his mind around that or accepting that. And, and I find it interesting you shared your testimony this morning, and I'm, I'm preaching the exact opposite. But praise God, we need, we need a moving of God's Holy Spirit so we hear more of these testimonies. Amen? Because I, I think our brother's testimony is also the testimony of what happened in the book of Acts. But there is a strong spirit of, of deception, a hardness of heart that we are dealing with in the world and in many places, and I think especially in the United States, it's, it's increasing. People doubt whether or not Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. 
John talks about this earlier in the book of John. Reading John 1, verse 5, the Bible says, The light, who is Jesus, shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. And there's a reason why people who are living under the darkness of sin and shame and death don't understand the light of Jesus because they don't have full vision. They are, we are, I should say, outside of Christ and the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives, incapable of wrapping our minds around the, the, the message and the power and the truth of the gospel. Light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not understand it. And this is what Jesus was talking about it as he wrestled with verbally, struggled with the religious leaders. I have come that you might have life, and life to the full, but it's only through me. What can I do to convince you? Because you have more than enough. But when we talk about light, we talked about what the, the, the plan of God is and how the light of Jesus opens up our minds to what the gospel is, what Jesus is all about, or who, what Jesus is all about, and what the gospel, the good news that Jesus saves, is all about. But what does it bring? And we mentioned this last week. Light brings life. There can be, you can have everything in this world, water, heat, fertilizer, but if you had no light, you would have no life. And Jesus said he is the life, light of the world, of the cosmos, and not, not just this physical world, which he certainly is, but more importantly, the spiritual and eternal world, and without him, there is no life. And one of the things that we need to rediscover, because I think we, if I'm talking to the church this morning, we've been bogged down by life so much that we have, when I talk about life, I mean the stuff that's going on around us, that we've lost the joy and the mission that new life in Christ has given us. Three things as far as the scope of, of the effect of, of the light of Jesus, the life of Jesus in our lives. Number one, abundant life. John 10.10, 10, familiar scripture, I, have, I came that they might have life and have it abundantly or have it to the full. Jesus just didn't come to, although this was more than enough, more than what we deserve, not just to liberate us from our sin and give us eternal life. He has come that we might have full life now. Now, <laughs> and I don't want to get into trouble uh, this morning. I, I know there are books and things about, you know, you can have your best life now and, and we can have a good life now. The best life is coming when we'll see Jesus face to face. But your whole perception of life and the enjoyment thereof and knowing Jesus is something that we can enjoy. You see that in the book of Acts, how great, there was great fear and wonder, but there was great Joy in the ministry of the apostles and those who followed Jesus. And there's a reason for that. In fact, if I could jump ahead to the next verse that I'm going to share, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation, the old is gone, the new has come. Things are brand new. We are new creations. The sin and shame, and I am jumping to the next point if you're following through my notes this morning. Um, 
I, I am jumping ahead a little bit. All our sins are washed away. You can have a brand new start. You do have a brand new start when you accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. All the things in your past that uh, ha ha has brought shame and guilt and negative consequences in your life are immediately washed away when you accept Christ as Lord and as Savior. That's the power of the blood of Jesus. It cleanses to the uttermost. And so we're liberated from that. We have a brand new life. But with that life comes abundant life. Well, we can, despite COVID or sickness or financial hardship or distress, whether it's you know, family distress, political distress, job pressures, we can have joy. I mean, if you're truly living and walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost, you could be working at your job for a boss who is just, just a, a terrible, I won't say he's a terrible person, I mean, we all are, but just a terrible boss and mean and, and needling you and, and, and doing all these things. The threat of closure, anyone ever been in that situation where you don't know if you're going to have a job next week, and so you know, there's a lot of, of wringing of hands and, and whatnot. Because Jesus is in you. And in the kingdom of God, there's not just joy, but fullness of joy. In the presence of God, the psalmist says, there is fullness of joy. How's everybody doing? Isn't it a great day? I know we might be closed tomorrow, but who cares? Jesus is alive on the throne, and he lives within my heart. And that's not just something we should pretend to do. Well, I'm a Christian, so I need to say that. Let me, <laughs> Let me put on my clown face, you know, in the morning. And... But it's something that should just naturally flow from our hearts and spirits. Why? Because in Christ, we have life and have it more abundantly. And this goes as far as peace. And I'm not saying we don't struggle and we're not sorrowful. We certainly do. But we have a river that we can go to in those times and be refreshed in our spirits. Amen? Amen. This is the life of Christ in the believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and as I just mentioned, of course, it's new life. A brand new start. And, and let me say this about this new life. In the Old Testament, I believe the book of, of Amos, forgive me for not having the reference, but may I say this, especially if there's someone who, who might be a little older here, and uh, you look back in your life and you look at a lot of years where um, you weren't living for God and you viewed them as wasted years. God wants to deliver you from that. Amen? In the book of Amos, the Bible talks about how God was, uh, because of the sin of the people of Israel, uh, of Judah, rather, I, I believe, and uh, for, again, forgive me for not having the reference, but God sent a number of things to, to turn them back to him. And, you know, sometimes God uses circumstances of suffering for us to turn back to the Lord and receive forgiveness and, and redemption and re restoration and healing. And one of the plagues that he sent were, were the, um, devouring locusts and insects to eat up all their crops. And then God said, I'm going to restore to you the years that the locusts, the palm worm, have eaten. Let me tell you, you might... You might be here on your 100th birthday. I don't think there's anyone here that old, although, Greg, your mom is getting close. <laughs> Amen. And think, I've wasted all those years. You come to Jesus, God will restore. And, and the remaining years of your life and the fruitfulness in Christ that you will experience th through those years will far outweigh those years that you have wasted.
because it's all under the blood. Amen? So there's new life. And then there, there's something, too, that, again, I, th I think we lose sight of, and that fact is this, the, the fact of that is this, if we know Jesus, we are just temporary residents in this place, and we have a better home, an eternal home waiting for us with an eternal body and an eternal joy and peace, e eternal experience that far supersedes even the wonderful experience that we have now, the wonderful relationship that we have now with the Lord Jesus Christ. Reading John's Gospel, chapter 4, verse 14. Whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst, but the water I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. I tell you what I feel, unfortunately, that causes a lot of believers to get wrapped up in themselves. And when you, your life becomes about you and no longer is about Jesus, that's when, you know, misery comes in and that, that's a surefire way for your joy and your peace, uh, your joy and peace of, of your salvation uh, can be sucked away from you. Is when you lose sight of, this is, this is just temporary. I, I, I'm kind of like, you know, we should be living like Abraham. I'm looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. You know, I, you know I, I'm going through this life. There's, there's a lot I need to do, and there are things I need to enjoy, and, you know, family and friends and, and all those things, and, and I enjoy a good steak. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. What are we having, honey, for dinner? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> not steak. I know we're not having steak. But nothing wrong with the, the, you know nothing wrong with those things. But we get so wrapped up in this world and in this life. I dare say, and I, and I've gotten to that age, so I I get it. I didn't get it before, but I definitely get it now. <laughs> I'm I'm gonna preach till I drop, so I won't have to worry about it. But you know, we we get to the stage where we're more worried about our retirements than we are about the treasures that we should be laying up in heaven where moth and rust and death, dust don't corrupt. In our last church, we had a precious brother in Christ, Brother Perry. And he was in his 90s when, when, when we got there. And, and he had worked for the state. And he had you know, a, a good pension and all these different things. And he lived so long, he lived well into his 90s, that all of his pension was gone by the end of his life, and every, all his property was gone, and he, he, he didn't care. And uh, he, he was, I, I, I didn't get to see him. We had left before he had got to that, that stage, but, you know, he was looking forward to being with, with the Lord Jesus Christ. But we, we've gotten caught up in that. You know, well, well, I have, you know, at the end of my life. And it, doesn't Jesus say, if we're in Christ, that we're not, I'm not saying, you know, go out and max out your credit cards. That's foolish. Or not save or, you know, those types of things. But to be consumed with that to the point where your retirement or maybe some other goal, whether it be, professional achievement or you know I want to I want to earn a you know I want to become a millionaire which you know really that isn't that much money in in these days I say that and I know there's some out there saying well g give me a million <laughs> it's not that much I I wish I, I I don't have it I don't care if I have it so we get caught up in in the things of this world and it robs us of our joy. This doesn't last. And in the light of Christ, if we're walking in the light of Christ and we've experienced his life in our hearts, 
And each day we should be motivated by the fact of we are one day closer to being with Jesus and all the struggles of this life will be gone forever. Yes, God gives me joy. Yes, God gives me peace. Yes, God gives me strength over sin. But the fight someday is going to be over and I'm just going to be in the express presence of God. That verse comes to mind from 1 Corinthians 13, verse 13. Now I see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. You know, I, I have a, a, a vision, a, a revelation of God, but someday I'm going to have one that is so much better, that is infinitely better. So what is this light in addition to being abundant life, new life, eternal life? It is two things. Number one, it is truth. And number two, it's not an it. It's a whom. The light is Jesus. One of the reasons that people have difficulty in accepting that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, or that Jesus is the light of the world and there is no other, is because they're, they're trusting regarding their souls. And let me dispel any notion, everyone, and I don't care if they say they're an atheist or agnostic, or if they're from Eastern religions or, or from other religions or religions that profess to be Christian but are not Christian. Everyone is concerned about their soul and what's going to happen when they, when they leave this, what happens next because there is I think both a mystery but also insight as far as what's going to happen. And one reason, one big reason that people have difficulty in receiving the light of Christ and trusting Christ as truth is because they're trusting in other things. Number one, we all know this, it does bear mentioning. We, we trust in the, the, when I say gospel, it's small g. It's not the true gospel, the, the false gospel of good works. If I'm a good person, I'll be okay when I die. I'm not sure what happens after I die, but as long as I die a good person, then everything is going to be okay. We've all met people who live that way. We've all thought that way. Not to get off the subject, but, but let me tell you this. Not only is that a way that many non-believers think as far as, you know, I just have to, I just have to make sure my good things outweigh my bad things and, and I'll, I'll be okay, which doesn't work. All It'd be like saying, well, to the policeman when he pulls you over, I obeyed the speed limit 99 times out of 100. This is just one time I messed up. Don't give me a ticket. <laughs> he may give you a pass, but he probably won't. The, way, the wages of sin is death, and every sin God will hold an account for, whether there are many or few. And they all have the same penalty, but uh, you know, getting back uh, to the point, as far as good works, we all, we all hope, right, and, and this is in the world, but this is also in the church, where we think we have this, if I could use the expression, this transactional relationship with God. And what I mean by that is this, we've, by grace through faith, and we'll talk about this more, um, not next week because Derek will be here, but two weeks later, we have this transactional belief in our hearts that if we're good Christians, 
You know, if we read X amount of scriptures every day and pray X amount of minutes or hours every day, and we attend church, and we do this and that, you know, we're involved in different things, then God will reward me. We think that serving God is based on a merit system. The better I am, the more blessings I will have in my life. That is, not only is that wrong, that's the exact opposite of what the gospel is and how God moves in the lives of people. Now, I'm not saying we have a license to sin and be casual before God as far as our relationship. In fact, I don't dare say, I, I definitely say that if, if you are careless in your relationship with Jesus, you don't take time to know his word, to spend time in his presence, to serve him, listen to the voice of his spirit, to fellowship with other believers, you will struggle and you will not have the abundant life that God has for you and you will actually undermine your faith in Jesus and put yourself in a very, very critical spot, spot as far as your soul. But your good deeds don't merit anything where, you know, Rich, I'm sorry, Rich, you're in the seat today, so <laughs> if your brother was here, <laughs> I'd pick on him. Yeah. Well, Rich prayed for an hour today, so I'm really going to heap some blessing upon his life. That's the way the world thinks. Do you, want, do you really want to live that way? I think, think of the other side of grace. If that's the case, you know, I've been a really good Christian today. I'm expecting God's blessings. What about the day you, that you haven't been good? You overslept, or for whatever reason, you didn't spend any time with God. Oops, you stubbed your toe and you said something that you shouldn't have said. You shared that so-called little white lie, although there are no little white lies, so please don't. <laughs> Pastor, there's no little white lies. Yes, I know. <laughs> then, if that's your idea, as far as, you know, God blesses us when we're good, what can you expect when you go out the door if you've been less than perfect, which we all have been? Oh, no. Here come the lightning bolts. I'm going to have a flat tire, break down on the highway, get fired, have my identity stolen, <laughs> forget my anniversary, and the list goes on and on and on. It's funny, but it's serious in that this, that mindset is exactly what the opposite of who Jesus is because Jesus saves us not because of our works but because our, of our faith in him because of his grace or his unmerited failure. In fact, even when I've had a less than perfect day, I can lift up my hands in praise to God not ignoring, I have to ask God to forgive me every day. But thankful that God, even though I sometimes still fall short, not only are you there to pick me up, but you still love me. And I am still blessed, and I am still forgiven, and I am still full of joy, and I'm still full of peace because my relationship is based on grace through faith and not by works. But that mindset is in the world and has infected the church. <clears throat> now, why should it bother us if it infected the church? Hey, listen. Sin, including the sin of false teaching, is not content just to stay in a small area of your life. Sin is corrosive. Sin penetrates. The Word of God and the Lord Jesus Christ himself compares sin to yeast, which if you mix in, in a, a, a batter of, of bread or whatever you're, you're, you're baking, will spread throughout the entire dough. Now you might say, well, you know, I'm going to take, for instance, lie. I'm going to lie, but just in one little area of my life, I'm going to lie on my time card. 
And uh, I don't want the boss to know that I take 45 minutes on my break and I'm only supposed to take 35, so I'm just going to cheat my time card. You know, I'll, I'll write it on or I'll have my friend, you know, kind of check it for me and a whole host of problems there we'll get into. But everywhere else, I'm going to be honest. Doesn't work that, sin doesn't work that way. You let down in one area of your life, and it will begin to cascade or spread into other areas. You'll end up lying to your friends, your family, or your pastor, whomever it might be. Sin is corrosive. For some, one of the, one of the another objection or, or, or another limitation on the mind of uh, people in the world today that, that speaks of the church uh, as far as the uh, as far as sin especially so we must keep mindful of that others seem to think that a, a lifestyle you know my, my lifestyle will determine my future and a lot of this comes from uh, uh, the eastern religions which come out of eastern mysticism you know uh, the belief in karma, where if I do good things, good things will come back to me. Um, and that's not just something that's in like Buddhism and Hinduism, that's also in a lot of New Age practices. And, and may I say, uh, and I've preached on this before, but there is a, a, a notable New Age element in some evangelical churches today that we need to be careful of. Um, not to talk a whole lot about it, but if you believe in Jesus, you don't believe in karma. Amen? If I speak good things, if I do good things, good things will come. But a lot of people feel that way. It's, it's akin to works. It's very similar. But it's just part of the mishmash of re religiosity that people have today where I can just kind of take what I want from different beliefs, philosophies, and religions and incorporate them into my own new religion, the Randy religion, where I believe, I may not believe in reincarnation, but I believe in karma. I may not believe in works, but I, I believe in a, a, a peaceful lifestyle that I, by looking within the inner light, <laughs> There's no inner light, <laughs> I'm sorry to say, but people do believe that I will find truth. Some it's through wisdom and knowledge, and wisdom and knowledge is great, but like anything, once it becomes an idol, and it's, it's good to investigate and, and know a lot of things, but it can become an idol to you, and, and therefore, uh, and what an idol is, it, it, it's, it's a god, it's something that you worship, and it's something that um, not, not only uh, do you sacrifice your life for, uh, but, but it's something that guides your life and your principles. That's not light. We're going we're gonna to end here in point one, and we'll pick up on this in two weeks. But all those things interfere with not only the only light and source of life that there is, but the true source of light and life that, that actually brings about everlasting change, both now and more importantly for eternity, Jesus. It's not a, a what. It's not joining a church. It's not saying a prayer. Do we, if we're believers, do we say prayer? Yes. Is prayer involved in receiving Christ as Savior? Well, if we do confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in our hearts, we'll be born again, yes. But the light of the world and the source of life is the man, the Son of God, Jesus. And no man comes to the Father 
but through him. John's Gospel, chapter 14, verse 6. I'd like us to stand this morning. We're going to close the message out with just a brief song, and then we're going to um, have an invitation um, as far as receiving or recommitting to Christ this morning. But let, let's sing this song as a prayer. Um, the song being this, Lord, I need you. And, and the emphasis is some, a lot of times when we sing this song, you know, Lord, I'm in trouble, get me out of this trouble. And there's nothing wrong with that. We're to cast all our cares upon Jesus for he cares for us. But the ultimate goal of the seeker of God, the seeker of redemption, the seeker of eternal life is to know and receive Jesus personally in our lives. So as we sing, Lord, I need you. I thank you for your deliverance. I thank you for your hand. But God, I want your face. I want to receive you into my heart and my life. I want the light of life to revive me, to lead me, to guide me. Let's sing together this morning.